Hey, thanks for tuning in to this exclusive interview. You're in for a treat. I'm joined by Larry Swedrow, Chief Research Officer at Buckingham Strategic Wealth, to discover his new book with Samuel Adams, Your Essential Guide to Sustainable Investing. That's right, breaking down everything you need to know about ESG, SRI, and impact investing. So let's go ahead and bring Larry into the conversation and dive on in. Larry, so good to see you. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure, Nat. So I wanted to ask you, you've written so many books over the last few decades. Why this book and why right now? Um, I, I, my main job at Buckingham is to write up the academic research uh, to help people make the proper investment decisions. Uh, so I read about 25 journals uh, every quarter and lots of other papers published on uh, the Social Science Research Network, uh, probably 100 papers a month to review what academic research are looking at. And we began to see a confluence here of two things. One, a dramatic increase in interest by investors in sustainable investing. It was a trend that began in about 2005, but really picked up steam in the last five years with uh, evidence of more climate change, the Paris Accords, uh, and all of a sudden, a slow trickle of investor flows became tens of billions of dollars a month beginning in 2018. And as usual, academic researchers became much more interested in the subject given the flows coming in uh, and research followed. And so now I thought it was a great time to write about a topic that was really important to many people. How could they express their values at the same time achieving their financial goals? So uh, I have the background to write about all the academic literature, the economic theory behind the impact of uh, sustainable investing on the risk and return of a portfolio. Having been written up already at that time, uh, when we began writing the book, about four dozen academic papers. Uh, so I recruited my friend, Sam Adams, who's passionate about this field. He started the first uh, sustainable real estate fund. And uh, so I recruited him to jointly work with me on writing this book because we found there really was no book that presented the history of the movement. And number two, presented very importantly, the academic evidence, and finally adding what impact uh, sustainable investors were actually having on corporate behavior, uh, was it a positive effect? So that's the background behind the book. Yeah, it makes total sense. It's a no brainer right now. I mean, we definitely hear it continuing within conversations, especially with management, as you were just referring to. Now in the book, you did talk about there's pitfalls. Obviously, there's a lot of pitfalls with a lot of different types of investing. But in regards to ESG and, and uh, SRI, what can you give us a little taste like you touch on a, a bunch of them in the book, but can you share one right now with our audience just so that they kind of understand how great this content is for them? Well, the issues here, I think everyone's familiar with the importance of sustainable investing in terms of climate change, also how employees are treated. Corporate governance is also, that's the G, part of the ESG is important to reduce frauds, for example, make sure companies are acting in the proper way to protect shareholders. Uh, so, you know, that's the main thing. The biggest problem in this field, and we discuss this in great detail in the book, there is no one definition of what good ESG is or isn't. And really a lot of it is personal values. And that creates a lot of problems in both the research and in deciding how to invest. So, for example, some people want to screen out tobacco and alcohol and gambling stocks. That's a traditional negative screening for SRI type investments. And I might like to gamble and go to Las Vegas. I have a glass of wine every night. Uh, so I wouldn't want to screen those out of my portfolio. Uh, I don't have a reason. It's not my particular values. And so it becomes a really personal thing and you can have people having uh, 
uh, two entirely different views on the same subject based upon perhaps their religious beliefs versus somebody's own social values. That creates another problem. And then you get into definitions of ratings. So we have seven different raters and they rate companies entirely differently. And that could come about simply because of how you decide to rate ESG. So a simple example would be someone could say, we think the environment is the most important. We're going to put 70% of our ratings on the E, 20% on S and 10 on G. And somebody else could decide to equal weight them. And then even within the categories, Dan, how do you decide on, for example, if a company is being uh, treating its employees fairly in terms of equality? Do you want to look, for example, the number of minorities and women on the board? Or do you want to look at the number of them or percentages in the management ranks? Or do you look at pay gaps? And then you even get issues related to some people will screen out, say, all carbon producing uh, companies like energy stocks, uh, like an Exxon Mobil uh, might get screened out. Uh, on the other hand, I would argue that a best in class approach is best because ExxonMobil and Total, a French company, uh, they are really among the leaders in creating patents for green sustainable energy. And if you screen them out, enough people do that, you'll raise the cost of capital for them, depriving them of the means they need to do the research and create the better future. So there are all kinds of different ways some companies in rating use a best in class approach, others use a negative screening approach, uh, and others an absolute score. So this makes understanding the research and actually deciding on your own portfolio, how you're going to implement it a little bit more complex. Great point, Larry. I want to go ahead and take a second, though, and really just make sure that we break this down for the people that, you know, are investing every few weeks when they get their paycheck, right? It's going into their 401ks, their IRAs and everything else. And, and they might have the desire to invest in these ESG funds, but they also are smart enough to know that, you know, management expenses are typically a little bit higher than the traditional index funds that we're all used to. And you, you touch on this in the book. So I was wondering, do you have something that you might be able to share with those audience members that we have right now that are in that specific boat? Yeah, again, I, I, I would urge this is really a very personal matter and there are no right answers. Uh, but as you noted, and we explained in the book, if you buy a total stock market fund, like from Fidelity or Schwab, you can get that for as little as about, I think, three basis points. Once you are going to add some social screening uh, or ESG screening, you're now paying somebody uh, significant dollars to do the research, interview the companies, etc., and you're going to pay higher fees. You have to decide, is it worth that extra expense to express your values? So we give people some examples of model portfolios that you can use uh, based upon funds we think at least do a reasonable job in terms of the expenses and bring some value added. But there are no right answers. It's really a complex question. Great point. Um, I, I do want to point out to people, though, that, you know, we're not going to dive into everything in this book because there's just so much good content in there. And I, I really do mean that. Like, for instance, there's a chapter towards the end where Larry and Sam, they break down portfolio construction and, and how you might be able to, to balance your portfolio with the ESG funds versus some that might not be so great. And you might want to hold off, right? The diamonds in the rough you're waiting for. But also, I mean, they give you 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 literally put in here a whole fund manager interview guide. Right. Like, I, I just thought that was so awesome. And I think when you're talking about the research that people should be doing, reaching out to these fund managers to say, hey, does this actually align with what I believe? And, and do I trust this fund manager? I mean, it's just really incredible, guys. But Larry, uh, I want to move on. I want to talk markets with you real quick. Sure. Um, while we still have a little bit of time left. Uh, so everybody has eyes on the Fed. We all know that we're all coming up on July 27th. I've got to ask you, what position are you in? Are you in the 75 basis point camp? Are you in the 100? 
or are we going to see a 50 with a surprise hike in August, perhaps? Well, first of all, I don't, uh, the evidence, uh, which is what we base all of our advice on shows there really aren't any good forecasts. So you shouldn't try to forecast necessarily what the Fed is due. And the best thing to do is to rely on what's called the collective wisdom of the market. The market is now expecting 75 basis points. If I had a bet, I think that's probably right. I wouldn't be shocked at 100 basis points because I believe the Fed has definitely been behind the curve and rates have to go quite a bit higher. On the other hand, there are already signs now that the economy is slowing partly because of the UK, Ukraine and Russia, supply chain issues, rise in rates, the cost of inflation, slowing demand. So we're already starting to see that, the impact of higher mortgage rates on the housing market. So I think the Fed is less likely to go to 100 basis points than they would have been, say, a month ago, uh, where I certainly would have been in favor of that. Uh, Right now, I think where I wrote a piece, uh, anyone could go check on advisor perspectives, kind of a mid-year review. I pointed out, I think this is the most challenging time for markets quite a while. There are nine specific risks I laid out, uh, creating great uncertainty and people hate uncertainty. You know, we have the all of the fiscal stimulus from COVID uh, and uh, trying to recover from that. We That was... Uh, aided and abetted, if you will, by extremely loose monetary policy, not only zero interest rates, but the Fed buying up bonds, driving down the yields on longer term bonds. And that created all this inflationary pressure. And that is built up. Then you compound that with the, uh, the COVID problems that are related to supply chain issues. Now remember, we had this globalization that lowered the cost of everything, made companies more profitable. We had just-in-time inventory invention. So, you know, that made companies more profitable, kept inflation down. Now we're saying global supply chains create risk. We've seen that both with COVID and the Russia-Ukraine situation. Uh, now we're going to be unwinding that. Well, the logic has to be the same. Well, if that could create inflationary pressures, reduce profit margins, et cetera. And just as the Fed in buying about $7 trillion of bonds in the last several years to suppress rates, they're now announced starting September, they're going to be selling a hundred billion a month in. And if you believe they suppressed rates when they were buying them, logically you should think we should see rates go higher uh, because they're going to be selling. And that is why the markets are down as sharply as they are. And there's a lot of risk in emerging market debt and high yield debt. Uh, we could see a contagion if in fact, their tightening of policy and selling off bonds, uh, you know, does drive interest rates even higher. Uh, so, and I think that's a big risk. And then of course, there are all these unknown political risks that are out there. And we have the tightest labor markets in history. That's gonna, keep wages uh, pretty tight uh, as well. So I think there's still a lot of risks here in the market and uh, valuations have come down quite a bit, uh, but they don't reflect a recession yet. Uh, one other thing I would add is the outlook for Europe and emerging markets could get a lot worse because of Russia turning off gas, possibly there, so there's risk. But everything I just said is already known by the market, and that's why right. stocks are down already. Remember, this is a lesson every one of your listeners should, should heed. It is completely irrelevant, I teach people, whether the next piece of news is good or bad. Now, that may sound dumb, but it's absolutely true. All that matters is whether the next piece of news is better or worse than the market expects. If you doubt that, think back to March of 09. The economy then went into a severe recession in the next two quarters. Unemployment shot up through the roof. We got to 10%. And from March 9th of that year to the end of the year, we went up 55%. Now, how could that happen if we were then just heading into a recession in the next two quarters? And unemployment went way up. The reason it went up is markets were expecting it to be even worse 
than actually happened. And we got government actions to try to turn it around. And the same things apply today. All of the risks I just told you are well known. They're in the prices. That's why the markets are down around the globe, 20%. It doesn't mean they'll go lower unless inflation is persistently worse than the Fed and the market thinks and they have to tighten even more or the Russia-Ukraine situation gets worse or God forbid China decides to invade Taiwan or some other event that we can't predict. That's Larry, really the most important lesson for investors. Larry, yeah, but let me let me ask you, it's like you're summing up a lot of the uncertainty, a lot of why the VIX is so high and we, right. we know the, the volatility is high. We know that all these things are in the market causing, you know, if you want to talk about Japan, right? Like you didn't even touch on that. There's so many different factors going on right now. So I've got to ask you the million dollar question is, is what sectors or stocks right now would you look at for the second half of this year, knowing that we're still in a whole circus? Yeah, well, uh, let me say it this way. I don't, as I mentioned earlier, the academic research on people trying to outperform by picking sectors or individual stock shows, that's a big time loser's game. The vast majority of the people who engage in that end up underperforming. I wrote a book I'd urge all your listeners to read uh, called The Incredible Shrinking Alpha. 22 years ago or 24 now when I wrote my first book, about 20% of active managers were outperforming before taxes and about 10% after. That's a loser's game. Today, the markets have become much more efficient uh, and for a variety of other reasons, it's become harder to outperform as we explained in the book. And today, 2% of active managers are generating statistically significant alpha and that's even before taxes, which are the largest expense for active managers. So it's more like 1%. What I would tell you is this, because of the dramatic outperformance of basically growth stocks led by technology, healthcare, that type of uh, sectors, value stocks dramatically underperformed from 2018 through 20. And they had the worst relative performance in their history, even worse, relatively speaking, uh, than in the late 90s when growth went on a boom. And then we had the dot com bust and the next decade value stocks crushed growth stocks. Today, we have virtually identical situation. And since November of 2020, uh, uh, the growth of value stocks have begun to outperform. And today they are historically almost as cheap as they've ever been against growth stocks. So if I were forced to make a bet, uh, I would be betting on small value stocks in particular, dramatically outperforming is the likelihood, unless we get a severe recession. And you base that on, if you look at the PE of say the large growth stocks, they're well into the 20s. And the PE of small value stocks, uh, like the fund I own, Bridgeway small value or dimensional small value or Avanta small value, they're all about eight. And they're even a bit lower in the international emerging market uh, uh, sector. So I think if I had a bet, it would be that value stocks are likely to outperform uh, uh, over the next several years because they're the cheapest they have ever been, almost. Not quite as cheap as they were in November of 2020. And since then, they've outperformed but they're still into the 90th percentile of relative cheapness. And so that's something I would look for. Look at valuations, use the PE ratios, and you wanna buy what's relatively cheap. That's generally a good thing uh, to do. Larry, can I ask you a personal question? Cause you, you, know, yeah. you touched on something really great about if a recession comes. So I know a lot of people look at the the terms of, you know, obviously the MBRE will come out and say, oh, recession, we're in one, or we just had one because it's kind of lagging. Um, do you believe that the, the two quarters of negative GDP growth signals a recession? Or do you look at factors beyond just that when you're trying to determine, trying to find your alpha ahead of the curve if we're already in a recession or not? Yeah, uh, first of all, uh, 
the economic data is a lagging. Uh, the stock market is actually a leading indicator because it's looking ahead of what the future is. So a better predictor of recessions is, of course, the stock market. Although well, there's an old joke that the market has predicted 20 of the last 10 recessions. Uh, we can all we can often have bear markets without recessions. Two quarters of a negative GMP growth is generally viewed as uh, an indicator that that's a recession or used as a definition. But it's not the formal definition by the NBAR, which looks at a whole variety of other things. And it's possible we are already in a recession by the two quarter definition because the first quarter was negative and there's some chance the second quarter will turn out to be negative. It, it's gonna be plus or minus a little bit, at least most people think around there. So we could already be one. And that would be unusual because we're, we would have a minor recession with unemployment unchanged. Uh, and given the tightness of the labor markets, unless we got a severe slowdown, I think it's quite possible we could have a recession with either no or only a very little bit of a rise in unemployment because companies, given the tightness of the labor market, are going to be reluctant to let skilled labor that's trained go, given they know how difficult it will be to replace them. Let me have one other thing for your audience to think about. Everyone's now enamored. The dollar's you know, very strong. It's risen dramatically. That's a real negative for the economy and for the markets. Uh, it's a negative for the economy because it's making our exports uh, more expensive, less competitive. It's making imports cheaper, more competitive. And that's happening at the time that U.S. inflation is even higher than it is around the rest of the world. So on a purchasing power parity basis, the dollar should be falling. But it's not because of interest rates. Uh, and the rising dollar, it's now roughly at around 108, it's come up. Every 1% increase in the dollar, I heard an estimate from an economist the other day, would, could impact the S&P earnings by minus 7%. So if you've got a 6 7% increase in the value of the dollar now, uh, you, know, you could see a big negative impact on corporate earnings. So keep that in mind. That's another risk. Uh, to the economy and markets as well. But again, like I said, uh, I'm not the only one who knows this. Again, that's why prices have been down uh, the way they have been, although not today. Yeah, no kidding. And that's what makes a, mar a market, right? Um, and yeah, good. Uh, you got me. MBER, not MBRE. I messed that one up. Um, well, let's go ahead and leave it there, Larry. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. I really uh, appreciate it. Just a reminder, everyone, Larry's book with Samuel Adams is out now. Go check it out when you have the chance, and I'll see you next time.